Okay, so I'll stop there for questions. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, we, we do have a few questions now. Um, let's say one study measured the outcome in three different time points. Shall we include all the three time point results as individual reports just to avoid bias? Or do we just include the end intervention value? What's your suggestion? Um, well, I guess it really comes down to what is the um, what is the purpose of your synthesis and what is the scope of your, your meta-analysis really? Um, I mean, you wouldn't really want to include all three time points in there because then you'd be double or triple counting participants. So what would be ideal is if you have pre-specified or thought in advance some decision rules to help um, uh, help decide which result you would include in your meta-analysis um, uh, before actually peeking at the results. And so maybe picking the last time point, maybe a good, there might be a good clinical justification for that, that or maybe randomly selecting a uh, result would be a more unbiased manner. But um, I think that would be a more reasonable approach. Um, another question do you, related to that other question. Um, do you think it helps to make your protocol more specific, specifying which measurement scales will be included and prioritising which data to extract for each outcome domain rather than just stating a generic outcome like depression? Or does that simply shift the problem from bias in the selection of the reported result for a specific paper to bias due to missing evidence as scales that will have been pre-specified? will not be included at all in the meta-analysis? That is a fantastic question and one that I grapple with daily as someone who's working on that Rob May tool looking at risk of bias due to missing evidence. Essentially, there is no good answer there because it's uh, you're right that if you do make, uh, the more specific you are um, and the more strict your rules are, um, the greater the chance you will have missing a risk of bias to the missing results in that meta-analysis. Whereas having a more broader uh, defined meta-analysis means that you increase your chance of potentially um, having to include a biased result in the meta-analysis. So that's something we're gonna try and work through in the coming months when we try and integrate these two tools together. But um, I'm glad that you recognize that they are interrelated in that sense and we don't have a really easy um, answer for you for that, but we will hopefully come up with some good guidance on that shortly. Um, can I just add to that, Matt, that um, in the risk of bias two guidance that we're, we've, done, we've created as part of the pilot within Cochrane, we do recommend that people specify the, the scale and the time point that they are interested in in the protocol. Um, and we've tried to relate that to the summary of findings tables. So, you know, we've suggested that people at least um, assess those that they want to include in the summary of finance tables because they will need that overall risk of bias judgment um, to inform grade. Yes, that sounds great. Um, okay, there's quite a few more questions coming in. Um, in your experience, how helpful and cooperative are trialists? Um, in my experience, I would say that they are um, generally very helpful. Uh, well, the ones who reply are. <laughs> So I would say my success rate on average seems to be about 50% of people who I contact in a very polite, non-judgmental manner tend to um, be willing to supply the information that I ask. And, and this is often couched in a broader assessment of um, not just wanting to know the outcome data, it can be sometimes wanting to know other information about risk of bias. Um, but yeah, I definitely think it's worth doing and, and um, uh, yeah, I, 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 you won't always get an answer, particularly for some older trials or for some trials where the trialists really just don't have any interest in sharing that information. But I definitely think it's worth, worth, worth the attempt. Um, we have a um, key to this is the statistical analysis plan. Cochrane reviews are able to include recommendations for research. Can authors recommend statistical analysis plans going forward if they are missing? as we suspect they will be, um, with, a, with a reference given for international guidelines for the content of statistical analysis plans. Absolutely, I think that would be a great idea. I think always the, um, I, I think a helpful byproduct of risk of bias tools and risk of bias assessments can be to 
help inform what future trialists should do and sort of set the standards for the next generations of trialists. And, and yes, I think uh, that, that um, the reporting guideline for statistical analysis plans led by Carol Gamble is a great resource that I would hope more and more people are making use of and making uh, more access to. On, the, on another level too, some may argue and some have in fact argued that um, as we move forward, maybe we should actually, um, rather than just uh, like requesting the statistical analysis plan, wouldn't it be great if we had access to the, the individual data as well? And so then we have all the data not necessarily um, at risk of being manipulated by uh, or analyzed in the way that we want it to be done. Um, so definitely I think it's worth um, as a call for further, uh, for further authors to actually start making this information more available. Um, what about systematic reviews assessing, for example, the effectiveness of an intervention, for example, rehabilitation intervention on multiple outcomes? Would we need to perform risk of bias assessment on all of the outcomes and all the time points? Um, so again, this is more of a broader issue with the ROB2 tool. Essentially, the ROB2 tool is designed so that you are assessing risk of bias for particular results uh, in, in, in a trial. So yes, that means that you would be expected to perform an assessment on potentially some multiple results within a study. That being said, we're not arguing that you would need to do it for every single result in the study, um, but rather um, it's helpful to focus on those results that are more likely to, uh, results in synthesis, excuse me, that are likely to be included in your summary of findings table. Um, so really focus on which results to perform the assessment on and link that with your grade assessment rather than necessarily doing it for every single result. Yeah, I've got a few questions. Um, should the approach to assessing risk of bias differ for benefit and harm outcomes, whether at the study or meta-analysis level? Um, sorry, I'm trying to... So I think it, it shouldn't differ but the way you're going to um, interpret the results uh, depends on the context. So if you are in the context where really you're comparing a new treatment to placebo and that probably the investigator is more likely to want to show that the new treatment is beneficial, the selective reporting will be more toward reporting statistically significant results for efficacy outcomes and non-statistically significant results for safety outcomes. But you can be also in a situation where uh, you are comparing two active treatments and the investigator is more likely to want to show that one of the active treatments is less beneficial than the other. And so you really need to consider the context. It will more depends on the context than uh, the type of outcome. Um, for, for signaling question 5.1, does this mean that um, is, if you have no access to a protocol, then it will always lead to some concerns over risk of bias? This is likely to be the case for a lot of older studies in particular, or is it acceptable to use the other information and methods and how the data were reported to give a rating of probably yes, even in the absence of a plan? I think one very useful... so. I, I agree that it's, it's, it's key to have the, the protocol and even sometimes the protocol is not enough and what you really want is a statistical analysis plan because, for example, the authors uh, adjusted their analysis and you, you know, it's not clear in the protocol whether this was planned or not. So it will depend on the situation. The registry and more and more trials are uh, currently being registered. The registry can also be a very important source of information to help you assess uh, uh, whether the, the, um, the outcomes were uh, selected, uh, selectively uh, reported. But of course, uh, you need also, and this was highlighted by Matt, and I don't know, Matt, if you want to, to add something, but uh, comparing what was reported and what was planned in the, um, in the articles can also be useful to, to see whether there's some unexpected and doubtful situations where you need to rate it as high risk of bias. Um, where can we download the software uh, risk of bias to? So, 
uh, we can send it to you, but I can put it in the... So if you go on, you can still see my screen. So if you go on uh, this uh, website and we will put the, the link in the, in the, in the chat, uh, you can access the full guidance document, uh, a sheet uh, summarizing the tool, and you have an Excel tool for implementing uh, ROP2. And so that's where you have to download it and, uh, and, and use it. And you have all the instructions and you can, uh, you can use it. I'll just add, just um, if people want to write down the link, um, uh, all you need to do is just type in riskofbias.info and that'll take you to that website that Isabel's got on her screen now. So just riskofbias.info and that's the main link. Um, to make it quick, have... You need to have Sorry. that to download it. Um, someone's asked if we can if you, they can access Risk of Bias Two in Revman Web. Um, I can answer that if if you want. Yes, please. Okay, so um, we do recommend that people use the Excel tool as on the Risk of Bias Info website that Isabel's just shown you. Um, at the moment, um, this can't be imported directly into Revman Web, so you would have to um, copy your risk of bias judgments for each domain not the signaling questions just for each domain into revman web um, i think the risk of bias team are working on an online version of the excel tool and hopefully um th there is plans to integrate that with revman web um at, at, at some point in the future and um, so it is in the plans but at the moment um it, it's not possible um we have time for one more question. Yeah, I think so. Um, considering the context in relation to harms and benefit questions, sometimes a non-inferiority equivalence trial is converted to a superiority trial, but this is difficult to detect in the absence of a well-written protocol registry entry trial report. How would this concern be reflected in the risk of bias tool? Um. I would say here it's, uh, the situations would probably uh, be quite similar to, to the assessment of uh, any trial. So I, I don't, I'm not sure it raises specific uh, difference in the way um, you're going to interpret selective reporting, uh, but um, That would be yeah, my okay. feeling. Um, what? Just one more. I think. Um, should the protocol be published? I assume that means for the trial that you're trying to access for signaling question one. Should the protocol be published? Uh, I don't think uh, you should uh, focus only on published protocol. You can have access more and more on protocols that are posted on clinicaltrial.gov, for example. A lot of uh, uh, investigator post it. And if you contact the investigator and request uh, the protocol, you can uh, uh, access the protocol. So what is important is to, to check the date uh, of the protocol and mainly the date of the statistical analysis plan. But for example, in the COVID systematic reviews we are, we are doing, we're contacting uh, all the investigators to obtain their protocol and they're quite willing to, to share these documents. You also um, have a lot of journals, sorry, a lot of journals that uh, uh, ask authors to provide the protocol as a supplemental file. Thanks, Isabel. And just on that note, is there any uh, has there been any discussion on sort of editing signaling question one? Because um, we've noticed that a lot of people, because of the way it's worded with the analysis plan, um, and people aren't picking up on the trial registry or the protocol. They are, they you know they don't have access to a statistical analysis plan, so they put no information in answer to that question. Yeah. I agree. I agree we should probably um, clarify this. <laughs>